It's even better. Uh, love that. Uh, this is the Open Global Mind weekly call on Thursday, August 1st, 2024. Um, Mike, did you want to jump in for a moment? Yeah, just to share that I've been very fortunate to spend almost two weeks in Sweden introducing my 27-year-old daughter to her roots, introducing my wife of three years to real Swedes, since I'm only half Swedish, even though I have a pretty Swedish mindset. And um, yeah, it's just been delightful. We've seen uh, about 40 of my relatives so far. Wow. And uh, in two days, we fly off to Iceland for four, five days mm. to see some of my favorite Icelandic tech heroes. But other than that, life is actually, uh, po politically, Washington is a lot more la rational than it has been. Um, I Yeah, like last week, I asked everybody to sort of settle in and think about what it was like just one week before. And uh, here we are oh, chug ch chugging ahead a little bit further. Thanks, Mike. Um, Glad I could join and I'll, I'll, I'll stay connected for a few minutes, but um, it's always good to hang out with people and share, share the excitement. And I love that you're carrying a little slim object in your pocket that lets us see you and hear you from where you're walking in Sweden. Uh, in, <laughs> from, from, well, from our early days in tech, that would have seemed a bit of a stretch. It'll be even more incredible if I can call in from Iceland a week from today. We'll see. Iceland's pretty wired. They're pretty good. I don't know. Well, we're going to be on top of a glacier, so we'll see. <laughs> I'm not sure they've put Wi-Fi on the glaciers yet. <laughs> cool. Um, hi, everybody. We are on check-in this week. So uh, I think everybody who's here knows the routine. Uh, maybe John, who just joined now, doesn't know the routine, but I will I, I will explain it there. And... Uh, uh, the way we've evolved check-ins, uh, we like pauses, so waiting between check-ins is okay. Uh, I will step out and just mute myself, and at some point I will check in, but I won't direct traffic unless somebody joins us who doesn't know the routine. Um, try not to get into conversation here. Check in only once until everybody has checked in, at which point we will shift into normal conversational mode. Um, try to keep your comments relatively brief so we have some conversational time at the end. And um, I think that's about it. There's plenty of things happening in the world, never mind all the stuff that all of you are doing. So I think uh, there's lots to check in about these days. But um, I, with that, I will go quiet and uh, let the games begin. Oh, that's right. There's Olympics going on too. <laughs> well, I like to think that OGM is the place to have the most serious conversations that I'm capable of participating in. And I've been somewhat disappointed by our tendency to avoid the serious questions. It seems to me that where we are is in a, uh, a future where we either uh, die by heat death, starve to death, or die by civil violence. And that talking about anything else is a waste of time. So that's where I'm at right now. And I'll go. Um, uh, I feel like this is an odd check-in, um, but uh, I just came off a call with my brother. Um, and so my check-in is about AI. Um, uh, I, th I think a lot of people, probably most of us have, have like 
uh, figured out that you can use an LLM to uh, proofread your, your, uh, your writing or write new writing for you if you wanted to cheat on your homework, uh, or, um, or maybe you can ask it interesting questions and sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. Um, I, I have a new modality or a different modality in which I'm using AI, which is to uh, do system analysis and, um, and uh, project, project management kind of stuff, project decomposition and project management um, and uh, programming. Um, it turns out that um, LLMs are pretty good at those things at, as well. Um, and most people don't have that in their... I mean, most people know the, the concepts, you know, there someone, somebody can develop software for me. Uh, somebody can help me do project management. Somebody can, you know, uh, do system decomposition and requirements analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, my brother's a high school teacher. Uh, he's, uh, he's got uh, his, his side passion for the past 10 years or something like that is uh, knowing a ton about the history of American handwriting. Um, he's, uh, and, and so he is one of those people who collects things. He collects specimens of American handwriting um, from the past you know, century and a half or so and loves to like take pictures of them and then describe them, trans transcribe them and um, catalog them and stuff like that. And um, he's had, and, and he's not technical. Um, uh, he's uh, super smart, but not technical at all. Um, and he has, has a lot, a lot of like people skill kind of kind of stuff. So he's he's in another phase of exploring how to catalog and manage his collection and you know put it in the right places and do the right things with it. And does that mean you should be using Airtable or Excel or you know whatever? So I went I went through and I said you should probably use a, an architecture a little bit more like Massive Wiki where you decompose the the information into single file records. I, I don't know, I don't need to get too technical. Anyway, I said, you know, and in the olden days when you used to, to talk to my kid, uh, my kid is a lot like me, very technical, very programmery. Um, you used to talk to uh, my kid, maybe you can actually do this stuff yourself. Um, you can decompose your, your requirements within conversation with LLM. You can help it do the project or help have it help you do the project management of assembling all the pieces and bits and bobs and stuff. You can even have it do the coding for you. Um, and and I've, I've worked with other people kind of using this new capability of, of AI to be um, not just a text assistant, but kind of a um, tech lifestyle coach or something like that. And, um, and I've had success having other people like write code. Um, so you don't need to be a programmer. You don't even need to know how programming works. You can just say, hey, bot, I need, I've got this kind of file or this kind of information. I need you to, to make a page for me where I can put that information in. Then I need you to transform it in these ways. Um, and it'll write all the code for you. So there's this new capability of um, AI that I think people ought to be taking more advantage of. And maybe it's, it's going to become more of a thing. Um, I know taking up a lot of time. The, the other thing is I'm starting to see systems that are built for like a sales office or a, you know, a small business where you don't need to, um, you, you, you do kind of the same thing I was telling my brother to do, but somebody's built a framework already for you. Um, so you have a bot that manages the uh, support, customer support inbox. You have a bot that um, writes your marketing copy. You have a bot that develops a marketing plan for you. Uh, if you're on a sales call with somebody or, you know, a, a vendor call or something like that, you have a bot that is listening to the call and telling you the, the next three or five or 10 things that you could be saying to get more information out of the person you're talking to or to help convince them to buy your product or something like that. That's another thing that's happening. That's each, each bot is like one of the LLMs that we talk to, but when you start to stitch them together and each of them has instructions to act differently, you get this team of as assistants that work with you to accomplish something that used to take 10, 10 people, and now it's you and a fleet of bots. Um, it's a fascinating new world, um, and uh, it's and and I think we'll get a lot more done. Uh, whether we're 
collecting handwriting um, or maybe even working on um, on climate. Uh, so I, I, it's an interesting and interesting future. I'll jump in here. If I if I add together what Doug's opening comments and Pete's following comments, um, what it says to me is there's some really critical issues to be working on in the world and some new ways to do that more effectively than we have in the past. And what, what keeps coming back to me, and it echoes a conversation I had yesterday, which is why it probably keeps coming back to me, um, is, is this idea of where do you intervene in the system? You know, like you, you, you see the world around you, um, what do you call it, polycrisis, metacrisis, you know, whatever, like there's a lot going on that, that, could, that could use your help and attention um, and we have these new ways to be more effective. Um, and I think the riddle seems to be, how do you, where do you place yourself, right? Like, where do you, where do you, where, where's the handle that you grab onto? Um, and it's a very personal thing, right? Like that, that, the answer to that question isn't the same for any of us. It's, it's different for every one of us, but maybe, I don't know, it would be really cool for me if this group could somehow, um, get get its arms around that maybe like as a template or in a formulaic way you know not not like a try to answer for john you know where he ought to intervene in the world but but maybe that that subject of of deciding where when where and how to intervene um tackle that a little bit You're muted, Gil. I know. Okay. I'm just, take, I'm just taking my time, Stacy. Just checking. Following, following the instructions. Um, so a couple of things. I know. I know that the instruction is not to react, but um, some things are prompted by what I've been hearing so far. Um. <clears throat> Uh, first thing I'll say just personally is that I'm I'm finding myself challenged by personally where to focus between immediate activities and big picture activities um, in terms of my own life and work. Um, the, the, the big picture piece has been the cooperative holding company um, that I've been working on for some time, which has been taking a backseat to the immediate concerns of income and the like. And the, my focus there is, as many of you know, uh, is ontological coaching, helping world changers change worlds. Um, they interconnect. Uh, finding the balance is challenging and um, got shuffled again this week in really interesting ways. Um, that said, um, uh, I'm really intrigued by everything that's come before so far. Um, um, I'm interested not just in talking about the meta crises, but talking about where we both individually and as this community uh, can intervene in that system in productive ways. And on that note, the last Living Between Worlds call that Ken and I hosted um, a couple of weeks ago, now posted on our uh, YouTube archive, uh, was taking the Danella Meadows leverage points, 12 places to intervene in the system hierarchy, uh, and, you know, and, and, and sort of polling ourselves about that, of where are we on that? Where do we place ourselves in terms of the actions that we each individually take and where we think we ought to, to take? And it was a really productive discussion that followed from that. Um, it was uh, some, maybe surprising or maybe not surprising that this that the group of people, the 40 or so people we had on a call, tended to cluster uh, toward the higher end of the ladder, or at least said we did. So that was interesting. Um, 
And so that may be something for us to revisit here, you know, one possible map for addressing that question. Um, uh, and then the the other thing I've been up to, which bears on, on, on Pete's comment is, you know, I've, I've, like many of us have been building AIs and playing with AIs and have built uh, an AI clone of me as a, as a coach, uh, not a lifestyle coach, Pete, but ontological coach, executive strategy coach. Um, and it's been fascinating. Uh, one of the challenges which was sort of evident from very early on is the, um, the dance between algorithmic approaches and emergent approaches. And so the temptation of having a bot that is coded to respond in all kinds of situations that might arise is really powerful and intriguing. Uh, and I also find in my conversations with human beings, although I'm somewhat predictable, more than I think probably, um, things emerge in conversations that couldn't have been programmed. Uh, and so uh, so that, that, I don't know if you call it attention or a dance or, or exploration of those two modes of engaging with each other and with the machines that we build is really fascinating to me, very rich and entirely unsettled in a lovely way. And I'm complete for now. I'll jump in if that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> I've been talking uh, in this group about this new philanthropic investment platform coming out of Impact Assets. It's a real grassroots thing. It's <clears throat> designed that, with our mashup for groups that takes several people to raise $5,000, but it can go really big. But it's easy to go big. It's, not, it's harder to go small. And we're linking that with what we hope will be a uh, a currency in the local college here, Warren Wilson, that has a non-cash economy. It's a work college. So they work 15 hours a week and get their tuition reduced. Um, and we think we can help them uh, in those things where they raise cattle and, and uh, biomedicinals and, and a lot of things. Uh, to help them become uh, create a gig economy with entrepreneurship fueled by philanthropic investing from alumni and then measure the non-cash economy. And we're talking to really good people who've created currencies in Africa and the US around it. And I think it's got a lot of potential because it, it, the non-cash economy has existed for 50 plus years and it's just never been quantified. So anyway, it's 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 got, really intriguing potential and and it's it's where i'm best where there's something in there but you don't know quite what it is and how it works and i'm i'm good at that and and then when i we figure out the gears you get somebody who knows how to make gears come in so anyway i'm i'm, I'm it, it's a it's pretty interesting new place to explore so i'm, I'm happy about it Let me jump in here. Uh, very inspired by your, all of the comments that are also now, uh, especially uh, the idea of uh, 
John brought in where you place yourself, you know, where the handle uh, you grab onto or the handle you can help other people find in you. So a lot of Gil's work uh, is about things like that. Uh, what's top of mind at the moment is the conversation that we had with uh, a number of people in India this morning um, who are initiators of what they call brand bodies, uh, which is... Uh, Hank, you, your audio is a little weird this morning. Oh. It's, like, it's like your microphone's not quite plugged in to Zoom or something. We can hear you, but it's it's mm. crunky. Is this any better? No, it sounds the same. Mm. Uh, well, let me see if I can fix it, and then I'll, uh, or, I'll come maybe, back to the video. Okay, or or just speak up a tiny bit, and I think it'll it'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, good at speaking up. Uh, uh, the the people in India initiated Grand Bodies, which is an initiative to bring young people and the seniors together in physical uh, space to investigate the things that they have in common and uh, initiative that I've been working on for the past year and a half. Uh, Crossroads Cafe uh, is attempting to do the same thing online, so it's not uh, people who are in India or the Netherlands meeting together in a physical space, but people who are any place in the world who are able to meet in uh, a digital space to discover uh, what they have in common, what are their common interests, uh, and uh, what would they perhaps like to address together. Uh, so building on uh, the United Nations Secretary General's uh, agenda of our common agenda, which is called the Intergenerational Solidarity, we decided this morning to create a value proposition about what uh, the value is of bringing teenagers and people over the retirement age in the 60s and 70s together, both online and face-to-face uh, -face on the ground. And we're going to uh, investigate what the value of that could be for the participants, for the worlds they live in, and for the United Nations uh, constituents in general, uh, we decided to submit it to the model United Nations, which is already working on similar things with young people, and uh, invite them to uh, uh, welcome old people, older people, uh, 65 and older, into this conversation. Uh, so, just to summarize, what are the value propositions about bringing teenagers and society's elders together? Hope, I hope everyone gets to see it then. So I'd really like to react to what Pete and Doug says, but I won't, I'll check in first. I find myself in the same patterns. Um, I'm continuously, you know, add more um, to my network, meet more people, meet new groups, find more uh, like-minded organizations um, instead of, you know, focusing on my writing and my personal work. Um, so I, I hope maybe now that I'm saying this out loud, I will 
change that this week and focus more on my production rather than my building my network. Um, I mean, as much as a network is important, um, finishing the work is probably you know, more important at this point. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, you know, I delayed um, reaching out to the, the the core people that I have to you know to get some funding so I can get the organization started. Um, I hope to do that. You know in the coming days or certainly by next week. Um, Cause I feel like I'm running out of time personally, you know, financially. Um, so I'm kind of in a situation where I either need to find funding or find a job and finding a job is really, honestly, really difficult guys, uh, you know, just constantly applying to so many places and getting such little um, replies. It's like, they don't even reply for the most part that you even applied. Uh, and then even the ones that they do, they rarely even reply that you know uh, that you didn't get the job or you know they're not going to consider you or anything it's kind of strange it sucks but anyway um so that's where i'm at Well, I was hoping to save my check-in for when Klaus came on, but maybe he's not coming on. Um, I came here to, to share and also to get some information because I think that um, I see an opportunity for education that could have political implications that has to do with water. So, um, what I'm, so right now, I don't know too much about it, but I think it's in Idaho that 6,400 farmers have been denied their water rights. And I know there's another state that's happening in as well. And what I see happening is the anti-democracy people, meaning they might, it might, their arguments might benefit MAGA, but they're not necessarily Trump supporters. They're pointing towards the government is doing this. And I think that this would be a great time to recognize and point out why the government would be doing it in terms of the corporate pressures behind that action and to shift the focus right there and bring people that are interested in the environment together. So I don't know if any of you know what's happening with the water rights um, in Idaho. And the other thing that's somewhat connected, and I think again, it goes to this libertarian mentality in my state, I keep getting these YouTube ads for my um, for my congressman, MAGA Mike. Um, <laughs> he tries to be the bipartisan guy. And at the end, it says support the, um, I think it's called the red tape reduction law. And anything that I could find in it, the only change it would make in my state is that credit card charges of more than $600 wouldn't have to be reported. Now, I don't see how that helps us, but most people here reduce red tape and that's enough for them. I looked briefly in Idaho just to see, you know, who was the governor and what's going on. And they're the most anti-regulation state. So that being said, I think there's something here. <laughs> if somebody creates some content, I'm happy to push it in the right direction and initiate conversations, but I'm leaving that to you. <laughs> I'm complete.
Um, well, the all the changes in the political sphere of the last couple of weeks um, had me ping a new friend who is an ex neo Nazi, and I met him because we both attended an event recently online, <laughs> and in which he, in his sort of introductory kind of spaces, he put a couple of his essays out there and said like look i used to be a neo-nazi and here's what i thought and here's what's going on for me and i was like wow and nobody paid attention to him during that event and i was like damn something really like somebody had courage and really stepped up during this thing and nobody paid attention so i <clears throat> i pinged him and we've had a couple of nice calls and he's deeply thoughtful and he's trying to figure out how things work and my question to him now in this last call was hey, is there any prospect, is there any way to reach out to people who are in the communities you used to be in and help help draw them away from being hard mega, voting for Trump, et cetera, et cetera? It's kind of a pragmatic question. And he had very thoughtful answers. And what's interesting is the answers revolved around stuff that would warm all of our hearts uh, about things like loneliness and masculinity and trying to you know young people are just really like not connecting socially they're they're emotionally having a very hard time so they're grabbing on to people like you know your favorite manosphere bloggers uh and uh latching onto those things and there's a there's a whole program there's a uh, you know there's a guy named a uh, pseudonym is ian ironwood he's kind of the the poster child of red pilling and of toxic, of, well, well, I would put it down as toxic masculinity. But if you go look through his websites, he has an extremely organized system for uh, seducing women, for being a strong male, for all kinds of interesting stuff that that like people are just absolutely latching on to. And uh, there's a whole mess of people with crappy advice for young men. And so he was saying, he was pointing to EFT, uh, emotionally focused therapy, and a bunch of other things, uh, and just leaving those at hand. He also mentioned a, a, a blogger whose name escapes me right this minute. I was just looking for him. It's something like Mark Morin, but it's not that. Uh, but used to be in the seduction community and then sort of grew up, woke up, something or other, and is now <clears throat> kind of an antidote to the manosphere, uh, at least from my friend's perspective. And I was really interested in looking through some of his work. I, I will uh, I will find uh, the mention again. But I was reminded by um, a story in The Atlantic, I think, long ago, uh, which is titled "All You Need Is Love." Uh, when we're out of chat, I'll put the when we're out of check-in, I'll put it in the chat uh, about Black September, which I've mentioned here in uh, OGM before. Black September was the terrorist organization from the PLO that did the Munich massacre of Israeli athletes in 1972. That massacre got Yasser Arafat invited to things, which he hadn't been before. So he needed Black September to step down a little bit. So he and his people put out a call across the Arab Crescent. They said, young women of the Arab Crescent, the chairman needs you. He basically married off 300 terrorists and promised them a bonus if they married, another bonus if they had a kid, they'd get like a TV in a flat or something. And then he tested them a decade later by offering them positions at embassies around the world. And all of these people knew they were identified. And if they went outside of their country, they would be arrested and put away. Nobody accepted the juicy positions at embassies because they preferred life at home. And, and so I think having a normal life and something to look forward to, which is an odd sentence to say here, maybe, or maybe just the natural sentence to say, but having a good life and something to look forward to is absolutely essential. <clears throat> Getting there might be tricky and might involve a bunch of therapy and a bunch of other things that people aren't willing to try or are afraid of or have been told is terrible or whatever. But I'm really interested in opening up those avenues so that a bunch of people who we would love to mainstream back into society can do that. Um, and there's a bunch of other thoughts connected to this, like our loss of the rituals that used to bring young people up into society. Older men and women used to bring younger men and women up into society in different ways. Those are mostly broken. Um, a whole bunch of things that that we relied on to make things work aren't happening anymore. And we haven't replaced them with anything good. So along come, you know, Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, and a bunch of other people in the deeper in the manosphere and Shibing Shibongo, 
uh, a lot of people align with that and like, oh, this is good. This this sounds organized and it sounds like something I can do. And by the way, they build community inside those worldviews, and they're looking for community. So I'm I'm my my point of leverage in the system, and I love that that came into this conversation really early. Um, is is trying to find places like that, and then figure out what what do we leave out in the world uh, and make visible to help people um, walk away from really toxic beliefs. Um, Doug, were you going to go? Carmichael? I went. Okay. I wasn't here at the time. And then I just saw your, your, uh, mic go hot. So, um, yeah, sorry. I was running a bit late, so I missed some of, of your guys's, uh, check-ins. Um, Kevin mentioned the work that he's doing with uh, local funding and, and uh, local currencies. And uh, I've been involved with him uh, and Stacy and um, some other folks on that as well. <clears throat> and that, as Kevin points out, it, it, there's a curiosity there um, on, on what that looks like and uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around what that might look like for for our work in in collaboratives uh, local community organizations um and and that that seems like there is a uh some thing that we're missing that that connects to a lot of what has been said since i've been here uh, especially with uh, what uh, jerry just said um the reason these folks, wherever they are on the political spectrum, are grasping at straws, <laughs> whatever straw they happen to be grasping at, is because things are not easy out there. Um, and all too often we try to change their minds so that they go do something better for them or better for somebody else or whatever it is politically expedient for us. but. I think we need to help them get out of the mess that they're in um, because whatever um, whatever is pol politically expedient before before the election um, doesn't solve the thing that caused the, the the problem in the first place. And I think you know yesterday uh, we had um, Douglas Rutzikoff on the uh, on the podcast and um, it was a a great conversation because he he he's cuts to the chase pretty quickly um we've got people who as jerry points out are lonely disconnected disengaged the only work they can find is menial work that that doesn't really mean anything um, or I should call it meaningless work. Um, their communities are destroyed by the multinationals. Now the gig work economy is coming in to this to, to finish them off, the local businesses. 
and they really don't have much hope. I, I live in Menlo Park, California, probably one of the nicest cities in, in the Bay Area. And I'd say one out of every three storefronts has got a for lease sign on. Right. And that's, I mean, literally two blocks over is the richest town in this in this state. And and we can't keep local businesses running. So what are those people doing? What are what are the people that would traditionally be working in small businesses doing? Well, they're working for the man or working gig work. And being very disconnected from from their fellow men, from their community, from what they're doing. I think there's a reason why people are angry. There's a reason why they're willing to grasp at straws. And I think we need to work on helping that have, get turned around because it's not long before it reaches all of us. It's not just going to be the small cities in the South. It's going to be every city because literally every dollar that we spend today, a whole chunk of that dollar disappears from our communities. It just gets evaporated into um, the pockets of uh, multinationals. And, and it's increasing rapidly. And with it, the destruction of our local communities. There, there's a a one to one relationship there. This isn't, this isn't something that uh, is not connected. And so my my realization, and it was interesting because I've been doing this work for a long time. But yesterday, after uh, some conversations in the afternoon, you know, you sort of put some things together, and you're like, "Wow, we're we're sort of fighting this on all sides." Um, but the thing that we're all fighting, we're not addressing the root issue. We're kind of all trying to put our fingers in the dike um, when it's maybe a little too late, that it isn't going to actually address the fundamental issue. So that's, that's what's top of mind. That's what's um, uh, energizing me today. Thank you. Yeah, I've gotten called away, so probably everybody else is gone uh, already. Uh, I just, it's the dynamic of most of my energy is usually spent on trying to, uh, I'm very future focused and big picture focused, and I've got, it's the, Charlie Brown and the football. <laughs> Every so I'm dealing with with that on about a probably at least ten fronts right now. Um, so, I, but then my I'm neglecting the the personal and the now you know, kind of things. So I'm looking to um, either two weeks or three weeks, I'm going to look to take a week uh, vacation and then come back and really focus more on my getting the personal stuff in line because I've been neglecting that too much. On my um, one o'clock meeting, uh, normal one o'clock meeting got moved up to noon, so I won't, won't be able to be on the full calls. To me, leave in about five minutes or so.
I think Gail went earlier. And if so, Patty, I think it's, um, uh, I think you're the one who has not gone yet. I don't know if you want to jump in, but there we are. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, I didn't really come today with anything uh, top of mind to check in around. I'm moving in the process of moving apartments here in town. It's been taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, yeah, I feel really uh, just in the process of what I did catch of the checking in because I did jump on late. I felt really compelled and energized by Jose and Jerry's shares and questions around how to support others in who, who might be existing and spending time and, and creating community and creating resources in what strikes me as an unsustainable place. Um, I think I, I spend, I guess recently I've been spending more time trying to understand and question whether or not it's even supportive to try to like help someone in, um, we'll use the example of, you know, someone who exists and spent a lot of time in the manosphere, you know, I, I have very little lived experience in someone that their way of seeing the world and understanding the world isn't the, the best way or, uh, which of course isn't what would be happening. But yeah, I think I just don't have much experience with um, really being able to create or support someone in their process of change who isn't ready to change or seeking, actively seeking the change. So that's always a question alive for me, like is, is what is being described even really possible? Um, I'd be interested in having more conversation around that. And I think I feel complete. Thanks, Patty. And am I right or wrong that Gil already went? Yes, good. Yeah, I did. Excellent. That's what I thought. Uh, I think that's everybody. Uh, so I uh, release the hounds. Uh, talk about whatever you like. Here's a link to my notes so far, which includes links to the article about all you need is love, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I still haven't found the name of the guy that my friend recommended, so I'm looking. Um, what else is uh, is in your heart, heads and hearts? Well, Jerry, I'll, I'll, I, I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Mike, you're on the hoof. Well, you you get you get priority for logistics. Well, th thank you. I'm actually momentarily in one place. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, we just uh, did a quick walk tour of uh, of Disney, but um, I wanted to pick up on what was just said about dealing with people who are submerged in a sea of disinformation, and uh, share a very disturbing conversation I had with my mother. Uh, I think you've heard me talk about my father, who, thanks to Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly, uh, went from being a very smart rocket scientist to being somebody who just throws up his hands and says, I can't figure out what's going on, but Trump seems to be on my side. <laughs> you know, it's just, but my mom, who has been paying a lot of attention to the news and watches PBS, apparently has been watching some Fox News and told me how appalled she was with the Olympics. She's boycotting the Olympics because of this kerfuffle about one little piece of the opening ceremony, which Fox News has convinced tens of millions of people was a parody of the Last Supper. Oh, right. Everybody knows about this, but it was a, a very kind of bizarre modern dance thing with a half naked guy painted blue to look like the god Dionysus and a bunch of other strangely attired people who were also um, supposedly Greek gods. And it was based on a painting, uh, not as famous as Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. There were far more than 10 disciples or 12 disciples in this picture or in the, in the, in the performance. But my mom, I mean, she was seriously not going to watch the Olympics because of these crazy French people who were making fun of Christians. And it is one of the most powerful examples I've seen of a concerted effort to brainwash a whole bunch of people in the course of two or three days. Um, Mitt Romney, who loves France, 
did his Mormon missionary here, I think it was in France, um, was over there and you know, said nice things about the French and the opening ceremony. He just got hammered on Twitter. I mean, we're not talking you know, 300 wackos. We're talking three or 4,000 people telling him that he's part of this conspiracy to denigrate Christians because he's a Mormon. Just weird stuff. But the fact that my mom, just from watching a few hours of Fox News and hearing these debates about was it really the Last Supper, had swallowed the whole thing. I, and I, I, don't, I didn't know how to deal with it. I, frankly, you know, she's no longer doing email. She's 88 years old. But I, I think I'm just going to get on the phone and read a couple of the articles to her that point out what was really happening here and why this is not something crazy. But I, I'm just so disturbed that this is a business model, turning rage into, into uh, viewership, into advertising dollars. It's a business model. And, and it goes back to where we started uh, you know, with Doug saying, well, we've got to do something about the decline of uh, our natural environment. If the people who don't want to spend money that way who don't want to throw away old business models and old, way, old ways of making energy have their hands on the levers to generate powerful disinformation campaigns, we're not going to get any of it. So we, we've got about four or five fundamental issues that we've got to get at, and we've mentioned most of them. But getting good information to smart people and stupid people has got to be part of it, or otherwise we're going to be in idiocracy, and that will be the way we we uh, stayed away. I'd rather idiocracy and Wally not be the harbingers of our future. That would be right. a bad that, that thing. Should, that should not be a business model. Mm -hmm. It is refreshing to walk around a city that was primarily built in the 1300s and to see how well built it was. It was obviously a filthy pigsty most of the time, given you know, what, what went on here. But they did know how to build buildings and they did have a I mean, there, was, there were things they did right. I mean, they didn't have crazy zoning laws that forced everybody to be on ha uh, quarter acre lots. I mean, they, they knew how to live tightly and uh, they did make use of most of what they had because they didn't have very much. Um, thanks, Mike. The, the next edgy part of the opening ceremony was Aya Nakamura's piece with the uh, Republican Guard Band. Uh, which was controversial also. And then there was the menage a trois in the library, but that's a different issue. Um, Kilden and Patty. Yeah, I must have missed the Last Supper thing. I assumed that the outrage was going to be over the menage a trois uh, or the many, many, many Marie Antoinette heads. Those and are good, though. Well, I mean, Especially you know, when they spewed blood out over the Seine. Yeah, it was not. It was not subtle. It was very French. It was. It was surprisingly message-filled opening. I was. I was kind of stunned by it. Um, Mike, I think you're, you're you're right on the mark with this. Is the business model, uh, and it's a successful one. And apparently, the the Murdoch family is arguing over the uh, succession plan and the business model of the future about that. Uh, it ties in with the business model of the country because with Citizens United, uh, some years ago. Um, there's, you know, there's the, 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 the uh, self-generating cycle of more money to buy more to politicians to buy more money. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how we break that short of, um, well, I guess we need a Supreme Court. If we get, like, if, if the left can get majorities in some of the branches of government, then it can pass laws like repealing Citizens United and putting limits on, you know, contributions. And maybe even, I would love, a, lim a, time, a time frame limit on election. Gary, Gary you're, are, are you intending to cut me off? No, sorry, I didn't know you, I didn't know you were done. You're not yeah, done. I was not done. I'll sorry. Go. Yeah, so um, um, where was I going to go? Um, oh, yeah, so on Fox... Um, a uh, fascinating moment a couple of days ago, Kurt, De Kurt Gowdy, who is one of their people, he was former sportscaster, I guess, now a Fox thing, um, did an introduction to J.D. Vance about the childless cat lady thing and told a very moving story about an airport encounter uh, with a couple of women and travel difficulties and take, taking care of each other, um, helping them get on their way through flight cancellations and so forth, and uh, ended the story. They, they ended the story by saying they asked if they could pray for him, and he said, "Of course." And he showed the picture, 
and it was him and two nuns in full habit. And he said, you know, these are childless women by choice. And they're women who would love to have children and can't for various medical reasons who are childless as well. And so turned to J.D. Vance and said, so like, what up, dude? It was, it was, it was a great setup. It was remarkable to see it on Fox. Uh, Vance, by the way, uh, squinted. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a poker tale. I mean, he squinted calculating what his response was going to be, I thought. And his response was, well, this was a joke. I, 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 don't, I don't hate cats. Which was double startling because like completely missed the point of the thing. Anyhow, so there's that. Um, um, to back to citizens of the United Jury, since you mentioned that, it's, uh, it's not a matter of winning just the presidency. It's a matter of winning majorities in both houses of Congress, which actually feels like a possibility this year. You know I mean, you know, not guaranteed. No, this is tight and it's going to be hard work for the next 97 days or whatever it is. But there's the possibility of a trifecta. Uh, you couple that with the proposed Supreme Court reforms that Biden has proposed. You need the court to overturn this thing. Uh, but clearly, that's where the business model of the country and the business model, Mike, you're talking about of the media are locked together in a very dangerous and destructive cycle. So now I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Sorry to interrupt you earlier. Um, and I'm wondering if Biden, so Biden can now take a victory lap and sort of rest, and he must be astonished by the outpouring that's come up around Kamala. He's not, How, he's, he's not resting yet. He's got six months of work to do. But he, I was just going to go there. He's got six months of work to do. And I'm wondering if he's going to take advantage of the almost unlimited powers SCOTUS seems to you know land on the presidency, unless, of course, they don't like the presidency, but that's a whole different issue, to do a couple things like extend the court, you know, Pack the court, et cetera, et cetera. I have no idea. Um, Patty, please. He can't, he can't oh, just real quickly on that. Yeah. As your, as your inside the beltway expert. Oh, please. Um, he, Biden has already said that he's not going to take advantage of the license that was given to Trump to break the law. And doing things like restructuring the Supreme Court would require an act of Congress. And in some cases, 60. Right. 60 senators getting together. It's going to require Democrats and Republicans working together. The good news coming out of the last two weeks, the best news that no one's noticed, is that 175,000 people have jumped on the Kamala Harris bandwagon to volunteer to get out and do phone banks, door to door, organize cookie sales, you know, whatever it takes. And that's the last time we saw that was with, was with Obama. In the primary against Hillary, um, if they can if they can do it right, if they can not, you know, they can they can they can avoid trying to promise seventeen different things to every little interest group, and instead say, you know, here's what we're here for. Here are the three things we're going to accomplish, and make it about all Americans. Uh, unlike Hillary, I mean, Hillary was very much, you know, I've got your answer. You know, you look at my look at my website. We've got uh, a plan for your interest group. And I think there's a chance that letting Biden fix things as they are and Harris talk about how they could be, that could That's be it. really exciting. And the good news that has happened since we got this call going is that the Wall Street Journal reporter in Russia is going to be released. Wow. Had not seen that news. Gil, can you hold your thought um, for Patty and Stacey and then we'll go <laughs> to Gil? It's just a quick tag on to Mike. The time the time that Biden could have packed the court was in December of 2022. Ah. When he had a Senate majority. Gotcha. Right. And didn't didn't make that move for all kinds of reasons, but that was can't do it now, could have done it then. Sorry, Patty. Thanks for waiting. Regrets. Yeah. Thanks. Go, thanks, Patty. Go ahead. Just just, a, just another point of clarification from oh, somebody who worked no, in the so Senate. You need 60 <laughs> votes. Yeah. You, the, the filibuster. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead, Sorry, guys. I just have to go at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna just speak something into the room and then head right out. Um, it feels like it's taking a couple of steps backwards, um, but the share Mike was sharing um, a couple of shares ago made me think. You know, I'm still sitting with the question of how or does one intervene in the um, progression of someone getting lost in disinformation in the manosphere? And I think what what occurred to me and something I think about quite often is that. Um, my lived experience would suggest that like humans tend to stay the stay the same until the the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of change. 
And what occurred to me about Mike's share was that like, oh man, I wonder if this business model that has been um, capturing the attention and the, the the hearts and the minds of so many has actually kind of tweaked that equation, making the the pain of and the cost of change like too kind of higher than it normally stands in in a, in a less charged or less uh, manipulated environment, right? So I think of I'm watching. I'm currently and have been for the last five years watching my uh, my family system really devolve into this space and kind of observing from afar and trying to understand what's going on. And I think what seems most apparent to me is that these systems have given and kind of maybe supplied a sense of identity, whereas perhaps there there might not have been a strong sense of identity before. Um, and the the things that the system is supplying folks who in, in my in my take, and the, you know, I would I would offer that humans, any human alive today is emotionally vulnerable to one extent or another, but I also think that there's there's quite a there's quite a correlation between unprocessed nervous system dysregulation, aka trauma in the body, and how emotionally and intellectually vulnerable uh, someone is to to things like manipulation and um, this, I don't know what to call this, this system of kind of displacing what one knows for oneself into to something else that feels um, a little more compelling to follow. So those are my thoughts, but I have to hop off, unfortunately. Goodbye. Good to see everyone. Uh, thanks, Patty. Somebody needs to invent a term for what you just described. There needs to be a, a name for that because it's an important dynamic. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for pointing to it. Bye. Mm -hmm. Stacy, please. Yeah, so um, I've been listening to um, Christopher Ray being questioned by Congress, and he reiterated once again what we know, that the misinformation, the way it's, you know, it's used is to sow discord among people. And that's why for like these past eight years, I've been saying there really is a way in through social media to combat this. You know, and I was thinking, you know, even with the Olympics, the first thing that I saw was not watching. And one of my liberal friends, you know, she immediately said, what are they not watching? What are they mad about now? And, you know, I was able to put it together as probably the Olympics. And I did go, and again, with people that I know in real life, but I'm communicating with them on social media because they have friends that I certainly don't have because I wouldn't have liked them, whatever their political beliefs were. They just happened to disagree with me politically. But I try to have the converse. First, I try to explain, you know, just talk about, you know, being offended because, you know, some of these people are the same ones that like we're calling other people snowflakes. So I just, you know, there's just so much there, but I, yeah, that, that's all I want to say. I, I just want to say that I think there is an opening if we were more arg organized on social media, just a little bit of organization, which is like why I came in with my request earlier about water rights. Because again, it only took 12 accounts to create that whole horrific scene with COVID. I learned that here on this call. So I just wanted to say that again. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Uh, somehow we've lost your audio. You are unmuted on Zoom, but we're not hearing you. And I don't think you've changed anything. Did you just put the earphones in? Try unplugging from the from your phone. Yeah, that usually works. Yep. Now now we hear you. Just to pick up on in, disinformation and how to convince people that maybe they believe something that's not quite right. Um, it has gotten so much harder, as Patty said, partly because people are organizing into tribes and they're they are alienating themselves from their families who normally might be able to correct their misperceptions. And so they, they end up with these tight groups. In my father's case, it was a little breakfast group, mostly retired Boeing engineers who got together. And, you know, if, if one of them heard something on Bill O'Reilly, he'd tell it to everybody else to make sure they'd heard it and, it, and, to, and to object and say, no, you're wrong, would have just been very difficult. It was peer pressure for 65 year olds, almost as effective as peer pressure on 16 year olds. And I, I, I do think social media can be something uh, uh, that's like a counterweight. But I, I, I have just noticed in the last six months a total shift in what these platforms are doing. Uh, 
obviously Musk did it first, where he stopped giving us what we wanted and started giving us what he wanted to see and what was more profitable. But Facebook is just, it seems like in the last three or four months, I am I used to be getting 80 or 90% stuff from my friends who were sharing things that they thought valuable and that I thought were valuable. And now it's more like 80% of stuff that some algorithm is trying to show me because they think I might want it. And they're, they're so, so incredibly wrong. And I, I want things that my friends think are valuable. So I want the social part of social media. But they're working so hard to turn it into a one-way medium like cable television, which obviously has been more successful even <laughs> over the years, thanks to Rupert Murdoch and others. It goes to business models. Again, sorry, Mike. sorry for my for my uh, for my rant, but it is it's again the business model is Gil said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real real quickly, Jerry, I just want to say, uh, Mike, one of the things that I do is I make sure to travel to groups because of what you said, because of knowing my stuff. If I post it, it's not getting there. I go to the group and I post it there. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Gil, then me, then Ramsey. Yeah, um, it's. Um... I've had I've had the same problem with Facebook, I think, just in the last month, and I've been talking about it and trying to figure out how to turn it off. Just a flood of ads, you know, blocking the whole feed, not seeing much from people. It seems to be better today, but who knows why? I mean, it's back to business models again. The business model of Facebook is the business model of any media that's free is that we're the product, right? You know, the game is to sell our eyeballs, and that's what matters. And so that's what they work. Um, um, uh, um, which way to say this? Um, Ma <clears throat> Musk, who still reminds me of Lex Luthor, exceeded himself last week when he retweeted a um, a um, uh, an AI fake of Kamala Harris. I don't know if people saw that, but it was like you know it was a, a video with fake audio in her voice talking about how she's a DEI hire and how she didn't pass the bar and you know like all sorts of bullshit. He retweeted it. Uh, with some positive comment um, to his, what, 145 million followers, didn't say this is a parody, didn't say this is clever, didn't say anything about it, just posted it as though true, and there it goes. And the conversation, I think, in your dad's group and in a lot of other groups I've heard is that somebody says, some, and I've seen po a lot of posts like this saying, quote, I heard somewhere that, and then comes the bullshit. Uh, no reference, no sourcing. Uh, no documentation, no link to the thing itself. Uh, we see a version of that of people who go ballistic about headlines, never having read the article. And, you know, it's 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 really difficult in this corporate media environment, but it's also something that people can learn about. Finland, among other countries, trains school children in handling disinformation. You know, in this country, critical thinking is seen as a dangerous thing to teach. But there are places where it is taught, where people learn how to navigate a world of noise and make sense out of it. Uh, some business models don't want that to happen. Indeed. All of which comes back, by the way, to Doug's opening provocation, which we are we are drifting from in two ways. One is we're not talking about the specific topic topics that he raised. Uh, but the other, and this I think is characteristic of us, is we're having interesting conversations about interesting things, but we're not talking about how could we muster ourselves, this network and our networks of networks to have an effect on the things that we care about, rather than just talk about them. Uh, election case in point right now, uh, I saw somebody, act, organizer friend of mine, propose that everybody spend at least as much time doing get out the vote work as we spend on social media. So that's one possible provocation, but I, you know, that's my echo of Doug is, um, and maybe it's a third kind of meeting for us to have uh, on our on our monthly cycles is how do we put this network into action around things we care about? I'm complete. Thanks, Gil, and thanks for steering us toward acting more on what we're talking about. Um, I wanted to put two short things in the room and then and then go to Ramsey. One is kind of ties the front of the this call to the back of this call which is this article that says that uh, large language models might actually be better at convincing people than humans are mm. uh, to do things like leave cults and movements. 
Uh, so maybe there's a way to automate the path. This is a terrible thought, but maybe there's a way of, of you know, harnessing AI to help in this process. Uh, the second thing is that nobody yet has mentioned the uh, amazingly outrageous performance by Trump in front of the Association of Black Journalists. Uh, and if you have not watched that clip, uh, I, you won't be able to unsee it, but, but do watch it. It's like he starts aggressive and he gets worse, not better. And I don't fully understand what his motivation was there other than deep frustration. But uh, I, my one of my hunches is that um, Trump is really mad because he's slipping out of the news cycle. Uh, and he's, he'll do anything at this point to like have the camera back on him. Anything, anything, anything. And all the excitement around Kamala it must be terrifying to Trump and his people because they they their lifeblood is uh, the oxygen of attention. Uh, and they're they're losing it in really interesting ways, and I love that. Uh, so, Ramsey. Um, so, if I can offer some perspective on the other side, perhaps um, we we live in a world of concentrated power, right? We're all disenfranchised. We're all uh, in, disempowered. We feel like we don't have control over our own lives, and so from that perspective, um, people are viewing the the world from their own and what's in their best interest. And so, um, and so from the MAGA perspective, they they see that. Um, the, the powers that be, they see it's concentrated. And it's, they, to them, they see the elite uh, being more the Democrats because they're they they were the side that you know that present ourselves as the more uh, educated. Oh, we know better than you guys. You guys aren't uninformed. You're not educated. You're not smart enough. Um, and so this, they see us as naturally as an enemy. Um, they uh, and they're not wrong. So from their perspective, their their motivations are to vote in a person like Trump, a chaos agent, because there is nobody else. There is, unlike us, like we're here together, right, for the same reasons that they are supporting Trump and that we're looking for some kind of system change. We're looking for us to change the, the, the game. Obviously, we're, we're not looking to win for ourselves over the MAGAs. You know, we're, we're looking for unity. We're looking for a world that is works for everybody. Um, but those guys aren't either educated enough, they're not informed enough, or they're not smart enough to, to, to have the um the the stage theory the, the knowledge of looking at perspectives outside of your own perspective or outside of the the, the secondary perspective you know uh, from the you know third perspective looking from above or even the fourth perspective looking from above from above or the fifth etc they they don't go that far they don't go beyond mine and yours typically um and so that's the world i think that this is the dynamic we're in right now and so they're not necessarily our enemies but at the, at the, that not having an alternative, not having a, 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 a possibility of, of, of somebody who's going to give them what they really, truly want uh, means that they have to continue playing the game. And that if the game is, well, you know, one, somebody's going to lose, somebody's going to win. Well, then I want to be on the winning team. And I don't want to be on those guys because we've been losing this whole entire time. I'm disenfranchised. My life sucks. And it's, and it's the elites. It's these guys who are doing this to me. And so that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. I don't know if that's landing with any of you guys, but it's kind of, you know, so anyway. Um, Ramsey, thank you. I'm going to disagree with you lightly in the sense that, I think a lot of people in the far right have lots of meta, in fact, sometimes more meta than the left does. Uh, they, they, have, they just have very different belief systems and starting assumptions, but it's not that they don't think, you know, looking in, looking in, looking in on the previous levels. There's a, just an incredible amount of that happening. One of the problems I see is that Trump is having a meta side conversation with all of his followers that the left and the press are just blindly unaware of. Trump basically is, is, is saying, hey, watch, I can do something outrageous and the left and the press are going to froth up and they're going to be incapacitated and they're going to give me a whole lot of attention and nobody's going to understand that and I will still be standing at the end of the week. That's a side conversation that's a meta conversation about the dynamics in the, in the political battlefield. And it's a better understanding of modern power about old media and new media and how to use them to win attention. That's it. And, and the left is, thinks that this is an election with normal debates and you know whatever else. And it's like, it's not. It's not. There, there's a whole different thing going on that the left is not meta about much at all. And that scares me a ton. I think the left needs to like freaking wake up about that and, and use 
ethical tactics that are similar. Like the left needs to open up that side conversation and go meta and go go stage left and say, hey, by the way, this this is what's happening and we're going to unmask it and uncloak it. And look how naked and stupid they look. But unless you step over to the side of the stage and whisper at the audience, nobody knows you know. Right? Um, and, and so that's got to happen. Um, and I, I have to say that the, the right is far more impressive on that front than the left. Uh, and if you go look at you know, the Jordan Petersons of the world and the the Lex Friedmans of the world and the Stein and everybody else, they run really deep. They, they will tell you five layers down why they believe what they believe, and they believe it very strongly and articulate it in some cases quite uh, ferociously well. So it, it, this is not, I don't think that the other side is necessarily dumb. I think they're seeing the world very differently and strategically, and in, in some cases using their dark arts to win power. Uh, but it's but it's but it's got a lot of got a lot of stuff in there. If you if you peel the the layers of the onion, there's lots of layers. But that's my point. They 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 see the world as a win lose. They, they see the world as a dynamic of hierarchy. They see the world but that, that that's but that's their worldview. Yes. Right. No. No. That's my point though. That 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 we need to change that worldview. We yeah. need to to show them. Hey, look, there is actually an alternative to that. You don't have to fight us. You don't have to win. We can all win together. If Klaus were on the call, he would bring up spiral dynamics right now and talk yes. about how we need to move up toward teal. I love missing Klaus on the call. Um, Pete, please. Uh, thanks. Um, this this seems like a small matter, but maybe it's I it it seems worth covering in a little detail. The uh, I I wanted to pick up on Gil's mention of the Kamala Harris uh, parody, uh, which. Uh, deep faked her voice. Um, it sounds a lot like her, um, but she's being very disparaging of herself and talking. You know, it's a it's a well produced video. I the the there's a um, it's it's really interesting to me. It's it's obviously a parody, uh, and um, I I wonder if we want to react very strongly to this um, because. I I I, th I think overreacting to this one. Uh, so uh, so let me let me do it a little bit more. Um, somebody posted a very well produced you know deep fake of Kamala, and it's obviously a parody. It's something that I would expect out of the Onion or Saturday Night Live, except it's you know high production value and it's not from uh, a known uh, parody outlet. Uh, but the original tweet says this is a parody. Uh, Musk retweets it and says, "This is amazing." With a crying, smiling, you know, happy, smiling face, he doesn't say it's a parody. He doesn't not say it's a parody. It's really easy to see under the the video. Click on Mr. Reagan, and you go, "Oh, it's a parody." Really well done one, actually. Um, Gavin Newsom says, "This this is insane. We cannot have uh, people deep faking voices and making political things." You know, and. I can totally see that. And I can also kind of feel like it's an overreaction because this is, I, you know, the, uh, the, the thing to watch out for is, so we're in a day and age where a deep fake voice is not, no big deal anymore. And anybody who hears a voice saying the wrong things should go, oh, I'll bet this is a fake. Um, instead of going, we have to legislate against deep fakes like this because it's gonna be impossible and you don't want to get into a situation where you reward the people who are trying to sneak past, sneak stuff past you, and throw the the you know the random funny stuff out the, out with the, the baby in the bathwater thing. Um, uh, this is this isn't the one to react to. Um, the ones to react to are where where Harris is. You know, Harris's voice and her face is saying something that it seems plausibly true. That's the one that you really have to freak out about. And and it's going to be really, really, really hard to tell that's happening. So I don't know. There, this one, like, it's like, I don't know if we should freak out about this one, guys. Um, and 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 trying to ban the whole idea of deepfakes is an exercise in futility. So you have to start rethinking where that goes um, before you start doing it. I'm afraid it's more than an exercise in futility. It actually proves the other side's case. Yeah. Which is super dangerous. We, we don't, we don't, you don't want to react in ways that the other side says you always react in. 
which is a, a valid criticism. You don't want to do that. Totally agree. And the other thing that I would be concerned about is that the other side will then use it so that every time we show these outrageous real clips of Trump, they say it didn't happen. So mm -hmm. I almost feel like in certain ways, things are planted for us to react to. Um, what I do think should be reacted to that I was surprised nobody brought up is the um, Dudes for Harris call apparently was thrown off line on Twitter for a while. And that's a conversation that I try to bring up when they start talking about, you know, suppression of information. Um, I, I, who else? Uh, hold your hand up if you were listening to the live stream of the white dudes call. Anybody? Nobody else? I was there. It was it was actually lovely. It was uh, very heartening. Uh, they raised over four million dollars. Uh, interesting people, interesting actors, interesting politicians. Adam Schiff was there. Pete Buttigieg, uh, a whole bunch of J.B. Pritzker, a bunch of people I hadn't ever heard their voices. I didn't know what they sound looked or sounded like. Not being scripted, just kind of being there. A few people were clearly reading things that they had written for it. Nobody went long. It was like pink, 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 pink. Kept moving, and a couple of things that really like were heartfelt. So I, I thought it was a really uh, lovely event, um, and plenty more to say about that. Uh, Doug, please. Uh, just to say that when you have a society with lots of broken connections between people and institutions, uh, the entropy in the society goes up. And a high entropy situation is very hard to bring any coherence to. Bring any coherence to. Yeah. Thanks. I, I mean, if you look around the end of World War One, there is like, Protests in the streets everywhere. Shit is hitting fan all over the place. People are scared to death of the rise of communism. A whole lot of weird and strange things happen at the end of World War I that we're still suffering from. A whole lot of things that cause World War II in some sense that you know uh, provoke a, a bunch of things. So all kinds of moments in history that this is echoing in different ways. Uh, and I don't think we're at that level of disorder quite yet. Uh, Jose? Oh, sorry. I thought you had your hand up. Uh, the the little hand up icon is over your. I don't like how the the hand up uh, warning sort of covers a piece of my screen. Anyway. That's Gil. That's Gil, not Jose. Gil, I, I know. Gil has his hand up, but, but just spoke. And uh, Jose okay. is next in my gallery view. And I, I was just thinking earlier, as we were quiet together, how much I really actually like gallery view. I love being able to see all of us and our faces looking at one another. Um, uh, so it's Jose, just the other white bald guy with a white beard. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and and so Jose was next in line, except over his the top of his head, over the, the, the over the chrome dome, and so forth. And where would have been that little raised hand icon was a, a warning that Gil had his hand up. So, uh, and Gil, do you want to step back in? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, I, I, I think you're faking it. You need to prove that. You need a photograph of the, your screen that shows that that really happened. I'm I don't sure. know how to deal with that. I'm actually an avatar being deep faked right now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, uh, when I watch something on SL, SNL, it's I know it's parody because the brand is a parody brand. And Onion is a parody brand and Musk is not a parody brand. So, you know, yeah, Mr. Reagan, it shows at the top of his tweet. But when you look at the Musk tweet, you don't see that. So there's that. Um, which isn't what I wanted to say. Uh, what I wanted to say was that Stuart Brand, and I think I think it was Coevolution Quarterly, or maybe it was Whole Earth Review. I forget what the timing was. Had a cover story about the um, uh, about the future disappearance of photographic evidence, um, and it was long before AI and the possibility of deepfake videos and so forth. But he called that one, you know, decades ago. That will come a time when you will not be able to introduce photographic evidence as evidence of anything. And here we are. Um, long ago, when digital cameras first started being a thing, I wanted and only recently saw somebody offering one of these. I think it's uh, Leica, Leica. Uh, a camera, a digital camera with a sensor that had a digital notary function that would send off to a digital notary a copy of the raw image as captured and sort of and certify it wouldn't that be cool now you can still doctor what's in front of the screen but you could certify that these are the bits these are the photons that uh, this sensor actually captured at that moment and uh, send that somewhere well that should be easier to do now than then 
Yes, no, I, it's just that nobody put in the effort to build a CCD or an or a, a image detector that had that feature. You'd have to bake it into the chip. And I think, uh, or, or right next to the chip. And I think Leica did that with a camera. When I said being trotsky I mean, when they painted Leon Trotsky out of a lot of the Lenin uh, and early Russian revolution pictures because, because Trotsky was suddenly a bad guy. But that took a little bit of graphics arts. A long time ago, my first real job in the world was at Mobile Oil Corporation before it was ExxonMobil. I was in the transportation department where my boss was Chris Caseman, who was the youngest company commander in Vietnam, a short West Virginian with an insane sense of humor that allowed him to get all kinds of license at work to, to do funny things. When anybody retired, he was given the task of roasting them. And I became his accomplice. And we would contact the, the retiree's wife, usually, because it was almost, almost all men sort of in the department, and get old photos from them and send them down to our graphics department. So they would doctor them up. And we would take, like, Roger Williams retired. And we had one picture of him. You don't know about Roger's time as a, as a priest. And we just paint, you know, had them paint a little clerical collar on him. And then another one, he had, like, bars in front of him. And another one was a picture of him skiing. And we painted a shark coming, you know, between his legs. That was all fun and good stuff you could do now by yourself in a trice that was then, you know, you had to send down to graphic arts. All these things, all the, the power tools at our hands right now are just astonishing. Uh, we are at the end of our time. We don't have Ken Homer, so we don't have a handy uh, uh, poem that fits the call. Uh, and I'm not sure I can think of one offhand, but um, anyone want to put a bow on the conversation? May I just ask Doug to repeat the item items he mentioned at the start of the conversation? The global warming or climate variability, whatever. And and there were two others and I didn't capture them. Three ways we might die, I think it was. Doug? Yeah, the three way not might die. I think we're on a collision course with the fact that uh, it's terminal for us in our lifetime. Uh, and the three ways are heat death through climate warm, starvation, obviously, and civil unrest as a result of the first two. Um, would anybody and like I to say if, if we can accept that as a reasonable uh, high probability scenario, then it would motivate us to look really hard from any alternative scenario of low probability that we could get behind. But if we don't name the high probability ones that are disastrous, uh, I don't think we can do the work of looking for anything else. Uh, would anybody else like to offer something that's slightly more optimistic? Uh, oh, crap. Yeah, let me just say uh, something uh about uh one of the things doug said in last week's call which has stayed with me since then and might be a interesting topic for next week uh doug said it's important to think about society's ability to get ready for the crisis times after the election and uh today we had a lot of talk about before the election but uh Whoever wins, there's going to be a crisis after the election. So I vote for that topic uh, for for a call in the near future. Thanks for saying that, Doug. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks, everybody. Lovely call. Really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Bye. More soon. <laughs>